It is Tuesday night Bible study. Glory to God. Well, thank you everybody for joining us out on Facebook. And we are going to jump right into the word tonight. So we have been talking for a little bit now about the, uh, the area of position, about the importance of staying in position and stuff like that. I know Tim has touched on it through his Bible studies, different aspects of staying in position and everything. Um, I believe last time I was up here, I talked about staying in a place of faith when it was related to position. So we're going to kind of stay on the same vein with the importance of being in position. And especially now where we're coming into this Passover season, um, you know, Passover the time being the time of uh, deliverance and redemption. You know, on Sabbath we discussed the second cup being the cup of deliverance. So, you know, it's time, especially now with it, we're going into Passover and everything, an opportune time to cross over from the old into the new. As you know, it's time to, to get delivered from some things, you know, and, and just like when they cross through the Red Sea, you know, when you cross over the Jordan River, you leave things behind you and move on forward. So another important aspect of staying in position that we're going to talk about, because, you know, there's a lot of things that you, that, tie into staying in position. You know, walking in faith keeps you in position. Walking in love keeps you in position. Well, we're going to talk about walking in forgiveness. And, you know, I thought it was an opportune time, especially now, like I said, with it coming into Passover and stuff like that. The importance of walking in forgiveness. Because I think a lot of times, many of us don't realize the importance of it. We don't realize the danger that unforgiveness can do to different areas of life. And we don't realize how it's tied into staying in position. You know, you can't be in position and then you're over here walking in unforgiveness towards somebody. It's just not gonna work. You know, you can't be believing for something in faith and you know, it's not happening. Why isn't it coming to pass? Well, you need to look at different aspects of life. So if you're holding unforgiveness towards somebody, if you're holding offense and anger, regret, bitterness towards an individual, it's going to hinder your blessings from coming to you. It's going to hinder what you're believing for to come to pass. So, so what we're going to do is we're looking at forgiveness, but we're going to look at it at a couple of different angles. And we're going to look at, you know, the topic of unforgiveness and how unforgiveness, when you walk in unforgiveness towards somebody, that it leads you on a journey of slowly and not well with you realizing it all the time, of hardening your heart. And we had touched on this on Sabbath with, uh, when we were talking about Pharaoh and stuff. And it's very important to understand what hardening your heart is and to stay away from that. Because getting yourself into a place where you've hardened your heart will cause you not to hear from Holy Spirit accurately, will cause you, you know, what does it say in Proverbs that, you know, you, you come, that someone that hardens their heart so much to the point that then there's no remedy to get out of it. You don't ever, ever want to get yourself to that point because then you're, you're, you're just done for good. So we're going to look at unforgiveness and hardening your heart. Now, there are different aspects that can lead to an individual dealing with a hardened heart. Tonight, we're going to look at how unforgiveness can do that. So like I said, on, on Sabbath, we talked a bit about a hardened heart with Pharaoh, and we're going to explore some of that, some of that in more detail now. But first, we need to look at the importance of forgiveness. We need to look at the, the, the contrast of forgiveness and unforgiveness and how it leads to the hardening of a heart. So the scripture we're going to actually look at is 2 Corinthians chapter 2, and we're going to first look at verse 10 and 11. So I'm reading out of the Amplified Bible. So 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10 and 11 says, If you forgive anyone anything, I too forgive that one. And what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, has been for your sakes in the presence of Yeshua. Now pay special attention to verse 11. Then it says, To keep Satan from getting the advantage over us, for we are not ignorant of his wiles and intentions. So right there, he's talking about forgiving. You know, if you forgive anyone anything, I too forgive that one. Why do we need to forgive people? Why do we need to walk in, in a position of forgiveness, a position of love? It's so that we keep Satan from getting the advantage over us. 
So as I'm talking tonight, I want you to keep that scripture in mind because that's a very, very important scripture when you look at it, to keep Satan from getting the advantage over us. So in other words, if you flip through the flip side of that, that tells me, okay, well, if you're walking in unforgiveness, if you're walking out of love, if you're walking in bitterness and stuff, then you're giving Satan the ability to have the advantage over you. And that's something that you don't want to do. You don't want to open the door for the enemy to come in and attack. Because walking in, and we don't realize this a lot of times, but if we're walking in unforgiveness, it can affect every and any aspect of our life. And we need to see the connection. We gotta, we gotta make the ties to it. So, walking in unforgiveness can cause us to start to harden our hearts towards someone and what Yahweh is telling us to do in that situation. You know, there's scriptures all throughout the Bible that talks about forgiveness. It talks about the importance of walking in forgiveness. You know, to forgive somebody. You know, what does it say? If, you know, I've forgiven you, you need to forgive them. If you can't forgive them, then how can I forgive them? You know, forgiveness is such a vital, vital, important thing. So before we go any further into it, let's actually look at a few more scriptures that deal with forgiveness. So Matthew 6, verses 14 and 15, says, For if you forgive people their trespasses, their reckless and willful sins, leaving them, letting them go, and giving up resentment, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. You know, that's pretty, that's pretty key. You know, saying right there that if you don't forgive somebody, you know, if you do not forgive others what they have done, Yahweh's not going to forgive you for what you've done. So you think about it, okay, so, you know, walking through a long period of time holding bitterness and resentment towards an, uh, an individual and I'm walking in unforgiveness towards them. But I do something and now I go and I'm going to go before Yahweh and repent for it and ask for forgiveness. Well, what does it say right there? If I'm not in a position where I'm forgiving somebody else, Yahweh's not going to forgive me for what I've done. So that's why we need to grant others the, the forgiveness, even when they don't seem like they deserve it. Because what did Yeshua do for us? We didn't deserve it. Yet he hung on the cross. He gave his life. He endured all that he went through so that we would be forgiven of our sins. And so we need to make that connection and see how vitally important. If he did something like that, okay, and he went to the cross and gave his life and, and suffered through all that stuff for us so we would have eternal life, but so that we'd have the opportunity to be forgiven of sins, how can we, who have never been called to hang on a cross, who have never gone through the things that he's gone before, through before, how can we not forgive somebody of something? How can we be in a position when we walk in unforgiveness? You know, we just can't. So the next scripture we're going to look at is in Colossians chapter 3, verse 13. And these are all out of the, uh, I'm reading out of the Amplified. So Colossians 3, verse 13 says, Be gentle and forbearing with one another. And if one has a difference, a grievance, or complaint against another, readily pardoning, pardoning each other, even as the Lord has freely forgiven you, so must you also forgive. You see the, the, the so to speak, repetition and everything? You know, he's saying, even as the Lord has forgiven you, so must you forgive. You know, you need to forgive before Yahweh will forgive you. You know, there's so much tied into that. And what people don't realize, they think, oh, well, I'm just walking my way and stuff like that. Yeah, I may be, you know, upset with somebody or angry with somebody about something without realizing that it's actually affecting them. It's actually costing them something, even though they might not see it right away, but it's costing. You know, Dad used to tell a story all the time about, I don't recall exactly detail for detail, but I think he was talking about an individual that he was, he was upset with or something like that. And Holy Spirit said to him, you know, look at it, you know, you can't afford this. You know, Dad used to say, you know, you can't afford this. And he used to f literally look at financially. I can't afford this. And he'd see money just flying away. 
you know, and we got to develop that. You know, I can't afford to be upset with this person about this. I can't afford to be offended by something. I can't afford to hold resentment or bitterness because it can affect any area. And dad used the, the, the illustration of, of finances. You know, we're walking in, in unforgiveness. It's going to affect our fin us financially. You know, and that's a, I thought that was just a very good illustration that dad used to use, you know, literally seeing money flying away. And, you know, and we can't afford it. We cannot afford to be walking on, on forgiveness because it won't only affect us financially, it'll affect us health wise, it'll affect relationship wise, it'll affect anything that, anything that we're believing for if we're walking in unforgiveness. So the next verse I want to look at, actually, I'm going to turn to this one, is in Luke. And it's Luke chapter 6. You know, and, and if, if Yahweh's saying this, and it is the, the uh, multiple times that he's saying it, then it must be a very important thing. It's got to be a very important issue that he wants us to deal with and get, it, and get over it quickly. So Luke chapter 6, verse 35 through 37. And, you know, and it's interesting, too, because, you know, speaking for myself, looking at some of these scriptures, it's like, you know, it can seem very hard to do. You know, like verse 35 starts out, but love your enemies. It's like, you're asking me to love my enemies? You know, you're asking me to love an individual that did something to me? An individual that may have hurt me some way or, you know, done something bad? You're asking me to love them? Well, there's a reason why. And he, actually, I take that back. He's not asking us. He's telling us. These are all commands. Okay, he's not asking us. He's not saying, Sherry, I'm asking you, would you please forgive, you know, would you please forgive Nicole for what she did? You know, I'm asking you. No, she's telling me, Sherry, forgive Nicole. Now, Nicole hasn't done anything to me. I'm just using her as an example, okay? But these are commands. They're not suggestions. He's not asking us to do something. These are commands. So Luke chapter 6, verse 35 says, but love your enemies and be kind and do good, doing favors so that someone derives benefits from them, and lend expecting and hoping for nothing in return, but considering nothing as lost and despairing of no one. And then your recompense, your reward will be great, rich, strong, intense, and abundant. And you'll be sons of the Most High, for he is kind and charitable and good to the ungrateful and the selfish and wicked. So be merciful, sympathetic, tender, responsive, and compassionate, even as your Father is all these. Verse 37, judge not, neither pronouncing judgment nor subjecting to censor, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and pronounce guilty, and you will not be condemned and pronounced guilty. Acquit and forgive and release. Give up resentment, let it drop, and you'll be acquitted and forgiven and released. You know, I like how the Amplified says that. You know, the way the Amplified describes that, do not condemn and pronounce guilty and you will not be condemned and pronounced guilty. Acquit and forgive and release. So it's one thing to forgive, it's a whole other thing to be able to forgive and release it. And that's what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to forgive and release it. You're not really forgiving somebody. You know, if I, I, somebody does something, by illustration only, Jordan does something to me, and I, I, I go up to her and I say, you know, Jordan, I forgive you. Or she comes to me and asks, you know, would you please forgive me for doing that? And I say, yes, I forgive you. And then two days later, I remind her of what she did to me. Or two months later, I remind her of what she did to me. Or two years from now, I say, listen, Jordan, you remember what you did to me two years ago on March 16th at 7.05 p.m.? during Bible study, that means I haven't released it. That's not true forgiveness. True forgiveness is, is saying, yes, I forgive you, but then releasing it. Not only releasing it from yourself, but releasing the other person from it. Because if I'm not releasing the other person from it, on my end, they're being held in bondage to that. Because then what could, what could Jordan think, you know, if I kept doing that, reminding her, well, do you remember you did this to me? Oh, but I forgave you, but I forgave you, but, you know, that, uh, that put a little notch in me, you know, I forgave you, but no, if it's true forgiveness, you don't even recall it. It's wiped off the record books, just like Yahweh. What does the word say? He doesn't keep any records of wrongs. Well, if our father in heaven doesn't keep any records of wrongs, we shouldn't be keeping records of wrongs. 
So when it comes to the point, you know, two years from now, by, and this was all by illustration only, you know, once again, Jordan hasn't done anything to me, just like Nicole, but it's like, you know, I, yes, I forgive you, and then it never, ever comes up again, ever. It's gone. And so if Jordan came to me two years from now and said, remember when I did such and such? And it's honest, I don't honestly recall it because I released it. And I can honestly say, I don't even know what you're talking about. I don't even re recall that incident. That's true forgiveness. But on the flip side, like what I was saying, you know, if I say I forgive you, but then I'm still harboring what happened, if I still occasionally think about it, that's not true forgiveness. That's not releasing and letting it go. And I not only need to, it's important to release it and let it go on my end, and it's important to release it and let it go on the other person's end for both sakes. Now, I would actually dare to say that, and I'll get into this a little more, it's probably a little more important for my sake that I forgive and release and let go, but it is, it is important for the other individual because if they know that you're not walking quite right with them because of what they've done, that can cause something within them. That can cause them to be, all right, the next time, you know, so the next time Jordan sees me, oh, I'm not quite sure how she feels about me right now. You know, I uh, might be questioning things, you know, or Nicole, oh, I don't know, you know, is Sherry cool if I'm going to give her a hug today? You don't want to put that other person in that position because then there's friction in the relationship. And what does the devil come to do? He comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But what is a big thing that he comes to kill, steal, and destroy? Relationships. He's after relationships. He's after godly relationships. And think about it. Why does it seem that there's so many attacks that take place relationship-wise are those that you seem to be the closest to? Those that it seems that like God has called you to into covenant relationship. You know, why? It's because the devil knows about relationship. What Yeshua did on the cross was because of relationship. What Yahweh did sending his only son was because of relationship. So the devil hates real, true, honest relationships. And we've got to be keen to that. We've got to be sharp to it. So if we have, if we're experiencing, you know, I'm getting off on relationships here. I wasn't supposed to be, but, you know, if, if you're experiencing something in a relationship, take a good hard look at it. You know, for all of us in here, I'll, you know, I'll be bold enough to say, we're all a close covenant family in here. So if we're experiencing, you know, by illustration only, if Nicole and I are experiencing something in our relationship, that's a work of the enemy that we need to get snapped out real quick. That's the enemy trying to divide and destroy because it's a godly, God-ordained relationship. He wants to just break covenant. He wants to destroy relationships because he knows this power in a relationship. But even more so when it comes to, and we know this because we've heard mom talk about it and dad talk about it, you know, relationships between a married couple. That's the most powerful form of covenant that there is between a man and a woman, between a husband and a wife, is the most powerful, strongest relationship there is. So why is it that you see so much, you know, come on, why is it that divorce rates are so high among Christians? That should not be. That should not be. Because Christian marriages are supposed to be the strongest. There's power in covenant. There's power of agreement between a husband and a wife. You know, and I, I learned that very strongly from mom through various situations through the years where Scott and I needed to come together on something and fight together as a married couple. You know, I remember one in particular and, and mom saying to me earlier that day, you know, you and Scott need to hook up. You need to hook up because there's strength in the power of agreement between a, a husband and a wife. It's the most powerful form of agreement that there is. Most powerful form of agreement because it's the strongest covenant. And I remember her saying, and she said that to me multiple times, but I remember in, in this particular thing, and it was like, you need to hook up. And, you know, and I'll say, it, you know, this particular day, it was in a battle of fighting for our unborn child. And it was like, when we're sitting in that hospital room, and we're having a doctor say one thing to us, and mom just before that saying, you and Scott need to hook up. The two of you can fight this together. And if you do what's right and you do this together, in your covenant agreement with each other, you'll get the victory. So Scott and I made the decision right there. You know, we're watching heart monitors. You know, Azrael is inside of me. We're watching heart monitors and we're watching in the natural heart monitors decrease, decrease, decrease. Doctors, boom, 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 you know. And it's like, no, I remembered what mom said. There's power between Scott and I and we can overcome the works of the enemy and save the life of our child. 
So we got together as one in that evening and we spoke over that baby and we spoke to the numbers on that heart monitor. And I mean, it was, I can't exactly say it was instantaneously, but it was quick. I mean, it wasn't a matter of minutes how quick that it was. We're all of a sudden, boop, and all, heart monitor starts going back up the next way. And the doctors had said to us, we need to, it needs to be this number. You, this, it has to get to this number or, or blah, blah, blah. You know, I can even repeat what they say. So it was like, no, that's the number it's going to get to. So uh, Scott and I were speaking to the numbers and we were speaking to Azraelia because she needed to do her part. Okay, she needed to do her part. So I was speaking to her, come on, Azraelia, you can do this. Come on, get your number up, get your heart up. Come on, beat, 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 beat. And we watched, boop, 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 that heart monitor go boop, 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 and get to the exact number that the doctor said that it needed to get at. So that then we were in the natural, the core, in their words, we were safe now for good. But that's what happened. We got to that number, and boom, we, it all was well. And, and we never experienced that again. But it was because of the power of agreement that Scott and I got into, the most powerful form between a husband and a wife. Now why, why would it be that soon, soon after that, and I remember this clearly because of the whole incident and what mom had, was talking to us about and stuff, why soon after that would the devil try to come and cause this thing between Scott and I? The devil was there, he saw what was going on that night. He knew what was happening. He saw Scott and I get together as one, as a team, to fight and get the, you know, fight until we got the victory. And he wasn't happy about that. So why would only a few days later the devil start something to try to cause division with us? But we knew all the, you know, we knew better. We knew much, much better. But that's why we've got to be so focused and realize, you know, when it comes to relationships, relationships. Now I'm talking about. You know, I, I got off on talking about married couples, you know, because, you know, I'm married, so, and that's the most powerful relationship, you know, Jay and Nicole, you know, Tim and Tiffany, you know, there's so much power in that. But even in just general relationships, you know, relationship, Jordan and myself, you know, we have a powerful covenant relationship. You know, I have a relationship with Papa. I have a relationship with Miss Peggy, a relationship with Unique. These are God-ordained relationships. Yahweh brought us all together for such a time as this. I mean, we think about it, I think pretty much each and every one of us in here has come from all walks of life, you know? We've, uh, I mean, I grew up in the state of Maine, who, go figure, this is where I am. And now I'm in, have a relationship with Peggy, who I believe was raised in Massachusetts, okay? You know, same thing with Nicole. You know, Nicole, I, I think, grew up in Massachusetts, but then lived in New Hampshire. You know, her and I came from two totally different worlds. But now Nicole and I, you know, we have a friendship, a relationship. There's a reason why God brought each one of us together. But there's also a reason why the devil wants to destroy it. And we need to remember that. We need to remember that and be keen to the attacks of the enemy. Because he wants to divide. He wants to divide. And if he can cause strife and division and stuff, he's taken the power out. And, and we've got to be very wise to that. So anyways, just went off on a little side note with that for whatever reason, but hallelujah. I guess it ties in with forgiveness, right? So <clears throat> walking in unforgiveness can cause us to start to harden our heart towards someone and what Yahweh is telling us to do in that situation. So going back to Pharaoh for a second, <clears throat> you know, we were talking about Pharaoh on, on Sabbath, with, you know, coming into Passover and stuff. And we all know the story very well and how he was hardening his heart and stuff. And we commented this, on this on Sabbath about you know, it took 10 plagues, for goodness sakes, okay? It took 10 plagues. The guy kept hardening his heart, hardening his heart. Now, I use him not in the aspect of looking at he was hardening his heart in, the, in unforgiveness because he wasn't, you know, forgiven the Israelites for anything. I'm looking at it as the aspect of an individual who is, is a very striking example of somebody who was hardening their heart. Okay, and like we commented on Sabbath, you know, okay, maybe after the second one, you know, maybe after cuddling for the night with frogs, that should have done it, you know. I don't know too many people that would want to, you know, spend the night with the frogs. But even after that, you know what, what was the next one? I believe it was like the lice or whatever, gnats or whatever, okay. All right, okay, that bad enough in itself, okay, but still, he hardened his heart and would not let the Israelites go. So then we go on to our fourth one. We go on to a fifth one, a sixth one. We get to the 10th one. And what does it take? It takes Pharaoh losing his very own. 
because his heart was so hardened. It took all, you know, now all the firstborn of Egypt, children and livestock, are taking out because of one man hardening his heart. Now, now look what happened. One individual hardening his heart, it just didn't affect Pharaoh and his family. It infected the entire land of Egypt. Good example of how our actions impact others. We talk about that so much. His actions impacted the entire nation of Israel. And, and I would say in a very extreme way, okay? I think losing your firstborn is pretty devastating right, to, to, a, to a family. But the seriousness of hardening the heart. So I use Pharaoh as that example because it can happen to you without you even knowing it sometimes until it's too late when you're walking in unforgiveness towards somebody. So when you look at the process, and you know this is by example only, but Holy Spirit had dropped this into me. It's like, okay, so you know, one day you're 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 you know doing something, whatever, and you know whatever. Jordan Jordan does something, and it's like, okay, so now something's happened, and now there's this rift in the relationship and stuff, but we know we need to forgive. We know we're supposed to forgive. Sorry, so forgiveness takes place. But then I go along on the next day, and I think, you know, devil brings it back into my mind what happened the day before. Well, you know what Jordan did to you. You know what, what happened yesterday. You know what she said. Doesn't that bother you? You know, think she was wrong. You know how the devil works. Now, what are we supposed to do in that instance? Why does Yahweh say take thoughts captive instantly? Because if we don't, you even allow a moment of it taking root in your brain, the devil's going to take what is really most of the time just something tiny, tiny, tiny and explode it into this whole big picture that never even happened. Well, Jordan said this one little word to you, and the devil's going to now have the picture painted at the end of it that Jordan said 20 words to you and then, you know, shoved you at the same time and, you know, took your favorite sandwich and ate it or something, you know, whatever. The devil is just going to explode this whole picture that never really happened. So now I'm thinking about that the second day, and it's like, okay, well, I forgave Jordan. Okay, I did. But then the next day, Jordan does something again that irks me, which normally it wouldn't irk me. But because I allowed that thought from the enemy to take root, now I'm letting something that Jordan did irk me again. And now I'm dwelling on it and dwelling on it. It's like, okay, I need to forgive her. All right, I forgive her, and I go to Yahweh, and I, uh, Yahweh, I repent. I, you know, I ask you to forgive me. I, should, I shouldn't have gotten angry at Jordan for what she did to me. I've forgiven her, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to change. Then a week goes by. And slowly in the back of my mind, I've been dwelling on the things Jordan's done to me, which now we know that's not forgiveness if I'm still dwelling on the things she's done to me. So now something comes up, and Jordan does something, and it's not even she did anything. Now I'm, now I'm getting irked by her just like showing up, you know? She just walks through the door and I'll say, oh, er, oh, I'm irked for some reason, just seeing her. But it's a process and now I'm slowly hardening my heart towards Jordan because I'm thinking I'm forgiving, but I'm not. I'm not forgiving and letting it go. I'm not forgiving and releasing it. I'm forgiving but I'm still keeping it in my mind. I'm still harboring whatever little resentment or bitterness that it caused. And so now the next time, it seems more escalated. And then the next time, it seems more escalated. And now the next time, you know, I'm now irked because I thought Jordan should have turned right onto the street when, you know, she turned left. And it doesn't even matter. Now it's turning ridiculous things because I'm slowly starting to harden my heart towards Jordan. I'm slowly starting to get in a position where now, you know, now I'm just totally irked with her about everything. And I've gotten my place, and Holy Spirit's been warning me, listen, let it go, let it go. As soon as the devil brings this thought, take it captive. But I'm not, and the thoughts are causing me to harden my heart. So now you find a year down the road, I'm in this vicious cycle now towards Jordan and having an extremely difficult time being freed of it because now, without even realizing it, I've slowly been hardening my heart towards her. Can you kind of see the picture that I'm trying to draw? So, you, you, you know, and it can happen real subtle and you don't even realize, you don't even realize you've hardened your heart towards somebody, sometimes until it's too late. But fortunately, because Yahweh's so good 
and like we were talking about on Sabbath, he gives warnings all along the way. You know, he warns you beforehand. He gives you the way out beforehand. He knows things that are going to come before you do. So when he tells you, you know, prepare for this, you know, he tells you, you know what, start to just gather a bunch of healing scriptures. Well, why do I need to gather a bunch of healing scriptures? I walk in 100% health. You know, I think I eat healthy. Well, you know, even in that area, you may think you eat healthy, but what is your definition of eating healthy? You know, maybe you think you eat healthy, but all of a sudden now you've got something that's happened and you think to yourself, whoa, well, wait a minute, I eat healthy. Why did that happen? But Holy Spirit had been talking to you months prior to that. Well, you know what? Stop eating that certain item. Stop eating that certain item. And you're not eat you don't stop eating that certain item. And, he's, and in the same process, he's telling you, you know, get a, look at your healing scriptures and stuff like that. Well, why am I going to decree healing when I'm in divine health? I haven't even had, you know, nothing. Why would I even bother doing that? Because he knows what the enemy has planned two months down the road by illustration only for an individual because he knows, listen, I've been telling you things, but you're not listening to me. You know, I've been telling you, stop, you know, whatever. Stop drinking the milk. I've been telling you, you know, stop eating the potato chips. You know, stop eating the beef. Stop eating the meat. Whatever, whatever it is. You know, I'm just using an example. Whatever it is, he's telling you to stop eating. Stop eating whatever. And you're not doing it. And you think to yourself, well, even if something, you know, it, it's, it could be something, like I said, you think you're eating healthy, but what's your definition of eating healthy? You know, a lot of people think corn is super healthy. Okay, you know what? It's not. Corn is like one of the most fungus control holding things that there is. You know, and what was the big thing for years? You know, people get off a of white bread and eat wheat. Wheat's super healthy for you. Wheat's the way to go. Well, come on, what do we know about wheat? You know, what do we know about all these different things? So a lot of times people think they're eating healthy and, and they're not. And that's why we need to be listening to Holy Spirit. And that's why, you know, beforehand, he'll warn us of things to come and he'll help us to prepare. prepare and he'll help us to, a lot of the times, get us ourselves in a position before and the event doesn't even take place because we're in position and we've done what we're supposed to do. But by illustration only, if we haven't, He's prepared us so we have the way to get through the position. We have the way to get over into victory and be victorious over it and overcome it and move on. But um, so anyway, so the whole hardening of our heart, you know, we got to realize that when we're dealing with people, somebody offends us or something, we got to look at the process of forgiving them. And we got to make sure, you know, forgiveness isn't just saying, okay, I forgive you. Forgiveness is forgiving them but letting it go and releasing it and taking thoughts captive. Because you know the devil's going to come like that. As soon as you forgive somebody, as soon as you're walking on the road, you know, and you decide, okay, you know what? I'm walking in love. I am, this is the thing I'm working on this year. I'm going to walk in love. If somebody offends me or does something that would make me angry, I'm going to do, you know, do, what was it, WWJD? What would Yeshua do? You know, I'm going to handle it the way Jesus, Yeshua handled it. Okay, and we don't realize how sly the enemy is. So we got to pay careful attention to this. And and unforgiveness is one of the biggest things that trips Christians up. And people don't think it means anything. People don't think it's a big deal. Well, this person so and so did this to me. They think they're justified. Now, and I'm not condoning and I'm not excusing wrong actions or anything like that. That's not what I'm saying. You know, they need to be held accountable for what they did. You know, just like with our children, they do bad behavior and sometimes their bad behaviors might hurt us and we don't condone it. We don't excuse the behavior. They still need to be corrected for the behavior, but we need to forgive them for hurting us, that type of thing. You know, I'm not making excuse for bad behavior at all, but we need to walk in a place of forgiveness and letting it go. So forgiveness is for our own self. What forgiveness actually is, it's for our own growth and happiness. When we hold on to hurt, pain, resentment, anger, it harms us far more than it harms the offender. And that's the truth. You know what? By illustration only, like I said, Jordan could do something to me. And, you know, the next day, I'm all riled up about it and I'm constantly, it's the thoughts running over in my head over and over again. I can't believe she did that. I can't believe she did that. And she's going along on her merry way and doesn't even think twice about it. Who is it harming? 
It's harming me. It's not harming Jordan. She's just going about her day, you know, her day, la di da da, you know, dusting her rooms and stuff like that, having a grand old, old time. While I'm back wherever I am, in anger and resentment and all this. Now, can you honestly say, like, I'm pretty sure most of us in here at some time in our life have, forgive, have experienced unforgiveness towards an individual. We've experienced somebody doing something to us that has caused us to be upset or angry or offended us, and we've had a hard time forgiving them. But can you honestly say when you're in a place of unforgiveness that you're happy? You're not. I know, are you, are you all jolly and happy and stuff, especially when you're dwelling on what happened, especially if it's caused a lot of anger in you? You're so focused on that anger, you're miserable. You're a miserable person, and the other person is just, like I said, they're going off on their way. It harms us a lot more than it harms the offender. Now, I'm not saying it doesn't, because there are incidences, and I said this early at the beginning, that it, it, is, it can do things to the person also that caused the offense. But the most impact is on ourselves personally. We're the ones that have to deal with whatever because we're walking in unforgiveness. So it harms us more than it harms the offender. When we walk in forgiveness, forgiveness frees us. It frees the other person, but most importantly, and I say most importantly, it frees us. It causes us to walk in a place of freedom. I mean, honestly, like, do you feel, do you feel freeing when you're like, er, Kenneth was just like irking me tonight, you know? Do you feel free thinking that? Do you feel free being like, oh, I'm angry at Kenneth because he did that? Are you joyful? Are you happy? I've never seen a happy, angry person. Oh, yay, I'm so happy, angry with Kenneth, you know? I've never seen a happy, angry person at all. I can't even do it, you know? But I'll honestly, you're not free when you're angry with somebody. You're not free when you're upset with somebody, when you're holding bitterness. You know, I've had times in my life where I've been bitter towards somebody, and I've got to say, it's an awful experience. It's a yucky feeling. Now, you would think, because it's a yucky feeling, you'd think to yourself, oh, I can't stand feeling this way. This is such a yucky feeling. I'm stopping it right now. But you find yourself all day long, I'm bitter towards that person. Well, you know. If it's such a yucky feeling, you know, really, you should get over it. I don't feel like feeling yucky, okay? I don't feel like feeling bitter towards somebody. I really don't. You know, I don't, if somebody does something and I get angry about it, I don't enjoy being angry because I know what it's doing to me. You know, it's causing me, obviously, to be out of position because if you're angry about something, you're bitter, whatever, you're out of position, okay? You're way out of position because the Bible says to walk in love at all times. It's a command. You're not walking in love, you're out of position. But just on the upscale of that, just the feeling that comes with it. You know, and you see so many, unfortunately, and it's so sad, you see so many angry people walking around. So many people are angry and upset and bitter because somebody has hurt or offended them. And it's a sad, sad thing. You know, Dad has talked about it so many times. You know, you have like the elderly woman, the 80, 90-year-old woman, you know, with you know, they have that phrase like, you know, grumpy old men, grumpy old women. You know, and there are a lot of grumpy old men and grumpy old women. And it's like, well, why are they grumpy? Because they're upset about something that happened in their past. You know, they're grumpy. In, you know, I'm not going to, I don't want to be known as a grumpy old woman. I'm not going to be a grumpy old woman. You know, I'm not going to be old anyways. But, you know, it's like, you know, you see, and it's sad. You know, you see these, a lot of these people sitting in the nursing homes, maybe not a lot, but quite a few, that are just, they're not happy. Now granted, I understand they're not happy because they're sitting in a nursing home. You know, I wouldn't be too happy myself either. But when you look at certain situations, you know, they're bitter because of something that happened to them. They're bitter that what a spouse did to them. They're bitter that what a, si a sister or a brother did to them or a friend. You know, dad had talked about something about, you know, this woman upset about something that her mother had done. And it was like 30 years ago. And the mother, I believed, had passed on. So it's like, that is such a strong thing. Why allow something like that to have such a strong hold in your life? You know what? Guarantee you, the mother that's passed on doesn't care anymore, OK? She does not care that she yelled at you about something 30 years earlier. She's moved on, so to speak, OK? That's not bothering her any. 
you're the one that's still on this side of the veil and you're still dealing with that. You're still living with all that. And you know, that's a, good ex that's a good example right there. You know, it's harming you more than it's harming the offender. The offender can't get harmed any more than what they are. You know, they're gone. You know, can't get more than that. You know, but in all seriousness, you're still dealing with stuff like that. And it's just, you know, it's just, it's something that we have just got to get out of our lives. You know, in the time of Passover, get delivered from it. What a perfect time. You know, get delivered from the bitterness, from the anger, the, the resentment, whatever somebody may have done to you. And I'm not saying it's easy, okay? I know it can be hard. I know it can be hard. You know, there's people that have examples in their life of people that's like, you know, they're, they're like a thorn in their side constantly. You know, it's like they're like this rose bush that's attached to their hip with all these thorns. And they, every time they see the person, just seeing the person reminds them of what they did to them. And it's just like, Ur. you know what, that's not the way to live. That's not the way to live. And we all really just got to, you know, myself included. I'm talking to myself as much as I'm talking to anybody else. I'm probably talking to myself more than I'm talking to anybody else, okay? But because it's a strong thing. The devil uses certain things strongly to try to get us out of position. And what does he often use? He'll use people. He use people against people, okay? My cat can't hurt me. Well, <laughs> maybe that's not a good example. We do have a, cat, a kitty that's a queen that, you know, I think sometimes when she's meow at us, she's talking back to us. I don't know what she's saying. I don't know if I want to know what she's saying at times, but, you know, but seriousness, you know, our cats can't hurt us. Our dogs can't hurt us. You know, we've said before, we can learn a lot from our animals. Okay, we can learn a lot from our pets, from our cats and dogs, because they are, they are more loyal and faithful and committed than some people can be, okay? But in all seriousness, people are the ones that hurt people. You know, there's that phrase, and actually it's not really, it's a phrase, but it's the truth. You hear all the time about how hurt people hurt people. Well, it's true. Hurt people do hurt people. And, you know, knowing something like that should give us a little bit more of a stance of compassion towards an individual. Yeah, maybe it's really hard what they did to you. Maybe they did something that was just so downright wrong of them. And they were in the wrong. They were in the wrong. But, you know, sometimes we don't realize what other people are going through. We don't know, realize what other people have been through. You know, we don't realize the upbringing somebody may have had or the parent they may have had or an experience that they may have gone through, you know? And I'm not saying, you know, there comes a time when, yeah, yeah, you know, you should get over it and be over it and move on, but it's not always easy. And so hurt people hurt people. And even though as, as hard as it may be, you know, well, they offended me and they said this to me, well, you know what? Maybe something had just happened to them prior than that. You don't know. Maybe, you know, you're in Market Basket and you're going down an aisle in your cart and you accidentally hit this woman with your cart because you weren't paying attention and the woman turns around and says to you, you know, you idiot, watch where you're going, okay? And we, you know, we have a choice to make really quick there. We can either be like, excuse me, you calling me an idiot? Or we can be like, oh, I'm sorry, ma'am, forgive me, I did not mean to do that, which is, should be our response right there. Oh, please forgive me, I did not mean to do that. Well, you don't know if 10 minutes prior to that, that woman just walked out of her house from an abusive husband. Okay, people act in certain ways for a reason, and we don't know. Now, maybe it just is that that woman happened to be an example of, you know, a grumpy old woman. You know, some people are just grumpy, you know, they just, that's how they are. But we don't know. But what most importantly is we need to walk, look at how we're walking and handling it because it affects us more than it affects them. But also, too, on the upscale of it, if you look, what does Proverbs, Proverbs say? A soft answer turns away wrath. So if that happens in the you know, market basket, that should be our response. Oh, ma'am, forgive me. I am so sorry. I did not mean to you know, hit your cart. That was totally my fault. A lot of times, an answer like that will turn a situation completely upside down. A lot of times, you can have somebody that's coming at you that just really wants to go full, full, at it full force in a fight and you just respond in love and a soft answer, you can return that situation completely reverse. Completely reverse. And you never know. You may even impact that person so much that it changes them. 
and sets them onto an easier course of a destiny of being open to hearing about Yeshua, because that's what it's all about. So, and also with forgiveness freeing us, you know, when we're walking in unforgiveness, when we're walking in anger, when we're walking, you know, in, in resentment towards somebody or bitterness, bitterness towards somebody, we're in actuality giving up our power to the other person. We have now given the other person power over us. They're actually ruling how we're going to behave now. If we're walking in unforgiveness and we're angry to them, they're actually controlling how we're, going to, how we're being towards them. We've given up our power to them. And that can't be so. You know, we're, I'm angry towards, you know, but I'm angry towards somebody. And now they have the full, full, so to speak, advantage because I'm the one that's walking in anger. I'm the one that's being ruled by these yucky feelings. I'm the one that's causing my blessings to be blocked. That's what this all comes down to. Now, if you're walking in forgiveness, you're believing for something. Don't expect that what you're believing for to all of a sudden pop up around the corner. When you're walking in anger and, you know, resentment and bitterness and you're taking offense about things, you know, take a, take a checkup. And why is it that maybe some things that we've been believing for aren't coming to pass? Why is it? Is it because we're still holding this against an individual? Is it because we're still being unforgiving? If we're still not walking in love towards somebody? You know, check what it is. But realize too, when you get this straightened out and you make that quality decision, I forgive this person, I forgive them, I release it, I'm gonna forgive people, I'm gonna release it, and I'm gonna move on and I'm gonna walk in love. It's a very, not only a freeing experience, but now you're setting yourself up to be a vessel for the blessings to start come upon you, for the things that you've been believing for to start hap coming to pass like this. So, when we forgive, we are being obedient to the word. Forgiveness means releasing the other from blame and leaving the event in Yahweh's hands and moving on. So that's the key part of it right now. If not anything else, releasing the other from blame and leaving the event in Yahweh's hands and us moving on. You know, now when you forgive somebody and you release it, that's now between them and Yahweh. Whatever took place, whatever feelings are on their end or whatever, that's now between Yahweh and that individual. That's their business. What we've done, we've done our part so that we can move on and be free. You know what? That's their whole thing. Just forget about it and just move on. So I just want to end with a couple definitions that I come across with forgiveness. So just to get something that will cement in your minds, you know, and, and, and think about and dwell on. So forgiveness means a conscious, deliberate decision to release feelings of resentment or vengeance towards a person who has harmed you, regardless of whether they actually deserve your forgiveness. Actually, that's only the only definition I'm going to say because I think that just covers it all right there. And I think it's just so very good in how it details it. So I'm going to say it again. A conscious, deliberate decision to release feelings of resentment or vengeance toward a person who has harmed you, regardless of whether they actually deserve your forgiveness. You know, like I said at the beginning, none of us deserve to be forgiven. None of us deserve to have Yeshua hang on the cross for us. Well, you know what? We have to grant people forgiveness, whether they deserved it or not, for our sake. And, and you know, actually, I'm going to read, I'm going to actually close with this last thing. Because <clears throat> I came across this thing that Rick Renner was talking about, and I just thought it was really good. Actually, before I read that, I'm going to close with one last scripture. <clears throat> and we're going to actually look at, we're going to go back to 2 Corinthians. And we're going to go to chapter 1. And this is what we need to remember with what happened. You know, we're talking about forgiveness and how Yeshua hung on the cross for us and how we need to forgive because Yahweh forgives us. <clears throat> and this is kind of pretty much where it all comes down to. So 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10 says... <clears throat> For it is he who rescued and saved us from such a perilous death, and he will still rescue and save us. In and on him we have set our hope, our joyful and confident expectation 
that he will again deliver us from danger and destruction and draw us to himself. I think it wraps it up pretty much all right there, what he's done for us already. And so then when you jump to the, back to the second part of the first scripture I was talking about, to keep Satan from getting the advantage over us. We need to be walking in a way so that we're keeping Satan from getting the advantage over us. In any area, any area that Yahweh is dealing us with us in, whether it's unforgiveness, whether it's anger, whether it's resentment, whether it's lying, whether it's stealing, whatever it may be, you know, we need to keep Satan from getting the advantage over us. And I think that's a very key aspect of where the whole forgiveness thing comes into. So I'm going to end with this. And I came across this from Rick Renner and um, thought it was pretty interesting talking about the topic of forgiveness. <clears throat> so it says, forgive so you can finally move forward. And that's huge right there. You know what I was talking about, it being freely. You can't move forward until you forgive somebody. You know, I couldn't move forward in my relationship with Jordan unless I forgive her. You know, how can you move forward in a relationship if there's unforgiveness in there? If there's anger, if there's resentment, if there's bitterness. And you know, and a lot of times, what we think somebody may have done to us, is it, they actually really didn't. We have the scale of it actually wasn't what the enemy's playing it out to be. You know, so we really need to look at, you know, we think somebody offended us. Well, they, they told me I was this. Well, did they really say that? Or did you hear it that way because you're allowing the enemy to cause you to hear that? Because the enemy wants you to get upset at the other person because he's trying to destroy relationships. So, forgive so you can finally move forward. Life is too short to sabotage yourself. It's amazing how harboring bitterness over something prevents progress in your life in areas that don't, that don't even seem related. That's why forgiveness is a gift you give, not only to others, but also to yourself. Forgiveness frees you and others to move on without being encumbered by unfinished business. I just want to stop there for a minute because that part where it talked about how it prevents progress in your life in areas that don't even seem related. You know, I talked about on Sabbath about an incident that we experienced as a family a couple years ago with our daughter and how after that incident, Holy Spirit told me why it happened and it was on my, my end. I opened up a door and I will say that um, right there where it says areas that we don't even seem that would be relate to, well, my action about something never would have thought that Australia would be the one that would get the consequence for it. But then realizing further, and I'm, I won't go into details, but part of that opening door that I realized is because I was walking in unforgiveness towards somebody. And Holy Spirit had been dealing with me for months, months, shamefully on my part, shamefully. It shouldn't have been months and months that Holy Spirit had to deal with me about something. But because I was so angry at this individual, and so upset and thought, you know, but they were wrong. And granted, maybe they were. But granted, maybe I had a part to do with it also. There's always two sides to every story most of the time, okay? But because I was refusing to walk in forgiveness towards this person, because I was hardening my heart towards this individual, it was interfering with progress in other areas of my life that I didn't seem would be related. And that other area of my life was my daughter. Well, why? Now that, you know, duh, light dawns on Marblehead. The enemy knows my daughter is one of my most important things to me in this world. So if he can't get to me, what is he going to try to get to? I open a door, where is a good chance that the consequence is going to come? And I will say that I will not ever, in my being, while I'm still standing here with breath in me, have something like that happen again that will affect my daughter. Just saying. But what's the point of holding a grudge against someone else until it makes you physically sick, spiritually weak, and emotionally frustrated? For me in that incident, incident walking in unforgiveness and having that anger was causing me to be spiritually weak. So even though I was standing in faith with my daughter at that time for something, because of the unforgiveness, I was spiritually weak. And I needed to get over that and get over that very quickly. 
And that's what can happen. It can physically, walking in unforgiveness can physically harm us. It can cause all types of things to happen in our bodies. Physical, you know, sicknesses, even a cold. You know, unforgiveness can cause things to take place in your body. But unforgiveness can cause things happen to you spiritually. Unforgiveness can cause things to happen to you emotionally. So why remain barricaded behind a wall of offense? And this is what I'm going to end with. The gift of forgiveness will help you step into freedom and move forward. And that's what we need to remember. The gift of forgiveness will help us step into freedom and move forward. Because when we do this, when we perfect this part of staying in position, and we step into freedom and move forward, we're going to start to see that there's nothing that the enemy can do to us. Just like what I read, that the enemy will not be able to have the advantage over us. And we will walk in total victory and overcomers every single day of our lives the way that we're supposed to be. Amen. Well, thank you all for Facebook for joining us tonight. I hope you got something out of that. And we will see you at 10 a.m., uh, 11 a.m. on Sabbath. <laughs>